Good evening and welcome to 16 by 9. If you constantly feel exhausted from lack of sleep, you are not alone. Millions of Canadians feel the same way, and that means huge profits for businesses that claim they can help you get a good night's rest. But it's not just about feeling tired. Scientists are discovering not getting enough sleep can literally affect every cell in your body. And that can lead to serious long-term health problems, from brain disorders to diabetes. Here's Jennifer Tryon. Hectic, incessant, relentless. The North American lifestyle is busy, and we're pushing our bodies and minds to the brink of exhaustion. The demands of work, and especially technology, that always keeps us connected to the office are taking a toll. All these electronics pushing us towards being more sleep deprived. We, we are now pushing the envelope to work as many hours as possible. Millions of Canadians don't get a good night's rest, and we've only recently begun to understand why sleep is so important. I think for the longest time, people just thought of sleep as a, as a period of time when really not much happened. We're increasingly realizing uh, that sleep is actually a very dynamic uh, time. There's, there's a lot of stuff going on in the brain, there's stuff going on in the body, a lot of healing uh, going on. The sleep circuits and the awake circuits of the brain impact on other vital functions, the cardiovascular system, the breathing system, learning and memory circuits. The evidence is there that sleep is like the engine of invention. Lack of sleep doesn't just slow the body and mind. Research increasingly shows sleep deprivation has wide-ranging and dangerous health effects. Some of the big advances have been an increasing appreciation of the importance of sleep for diseases like heart disease, uh, like diabetes, uh, for obesity, and for things like, uh, like dementia, uh, for stroke. If you don't sleep, there is harmful effects on your metabolism, on every cell that you have in your body. Researchers in Chicago, like Dr. Esra Tasali, have been at the forefront of the rapidly expanding study of sleep and its importance to the entire body. Fifteen years ago, our lab conducted a study that was the first demonstration that there's a strong link between uh, sleep deprivation and diabetes risk. And that link between sleep deprivation and diabetes was evident almost immediately. We took healthy volunteers and we sleep deprived them in the laboratory and they showed as if they were in the pre-diabetic state after sleep deprivation. This was only after one week of uh, sleep deprivation and it wasn't total sleep deprivation, it was four and a half hours in bed. Sleep deprivation, short sleep duration, increases your risk for type 2 diabetes. Building on that research, Dr. Tasali is now looking at the link between sleep and metabolism which ties into a higher risk of diabetes, obesity, and heart disease. Davida Nobles is one of 80 participants in the new study. Um, I have two kids, so often I don't get to bed until after they do, and then I wake up before they do in the morning. Davida is about halfway through the testing. Her results will tell researchers if more sleep will have a positive impact on her metabolism. Sleep deprivation can be associated with high uh, body mass index, uh, increased weight, mild sleep restriction, as little as one hour of sleep loss can put you at risk for uh, obesity. And sleep restriction doesn't just affect what your body does with food, it can also affect which food you put into your body. Sleep deprivation can make you more hungry and craving for foods that you wouldn't normally crave for all the time, like sugar. This is your watch that's going to capture your sleep-wake schedule. Stretch up nice and tall. Okay, come on down. So what we're going to do is I'm going to scan you from the top of your head to the tips of your toes. Brian Lee is a new subject in the same study. Technicians measure his body composition and over time monitor whether the quantity and quality of his sleep is affecting his metabolism and weight. They told me that they were looking for someone who's my, like a little overweight and that I looked down at myself and said, I think I might qualify for that. They were looking for someone who got around six to seven hours of sleep a night. Uh, and that's a, around what I averaged and I don't have a problem sleeping through the night. 
Dr. Tasali says many people, like Brian, think they're getting enough rest, but they aren't, and don't realize how much stress they're putting on their bodies. In the past, it was thought that if you were to be sleep deprived, you will be less alert, you will have uh, cognitive deficits, but now we know that it also affects your body, your metabolism, your, how your body regulates your cardiovascular system. Okay, Brian. Whoa. That's you in your entirety. It's your skeletal and this is your body count. Over the last decade, scientists have learned lack of sleep doesn't just make us feel weary, it can actually increase the risk of diabetes, obesity, and heart disease. And that's just the beginning. I think that we should be understanding mechanisms linking sleep to the rest of the body, and uh, we could take more advantage of the advanced methods of brain imaging. That's what Canadian researchers at Sunnybrook Hospital in Toronto are working on. Over the next two decades, a landmark study will investigate how sleep affects the brain. What we're doing uh, is we're asking uh, for up, up to 4,000 uh, volunteers in Ontario uh, to take devices home to measure their own sleep in their own homes. Uh, and then what we'll be doing, uh, including MRI, uh, is relating this to the long-term risk uh, over five years, 10 years, 20 years of developing things like Alzheimer's disease and strokes. That research will add to evidence that has already shown that sleeping less or even just waking up in the middle of the night can actually cause physical changes to the brain. What we found was that those with the most fragmented sleep uh, also had uh, the smallest volumes in the frontal lobes, uh, which is an area of the brain that's, that's important for higher thought. Waking up a lot at night uh, seems to be associated with an increased risk uh, of developing Alzheimer's disease over time. As Canadians get older, our understanding of the link between sleep and brain diseases like dementia and Alzheimer's will affect millions of lives. Even in people who didn't have Alzheimer's disease already, people who were seemingly cognitively normal, uh, of those, uh, it was the individuals who had uh, the worst sleep, who woke up the most at night, uh, who had subsequently had the highest risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's, dementia, stroke, three major problems for an aging society. The good news is the risk of developing some sleep-related health problems can be reduced. There's so many sleep disorders that can be identified and treated. In the sense that we're taking a look at something that we can really do something about, uh, it could be a real, uh, a real game changer. Back in Chicago, the benefits of getting more sleep and making lifestyle changes are beginning to show for Dr. Tasali's study subjects like Kendall Farlow. So uh, today we're going to review a little bit your uh, sleep patterns, okay. okay? Dr. Tasali's study is designed to measure the effects of sleep extension by rescheduling subjects' lifestyles so they can get eight and a half hours of sleep a day. I really used to having a set bedtime, so mm -hmm. when you set one, then you have to try to rationalize your life around it. Kendall has managed to extend his sleep by nearly an hour and a half per day. He's already seeing positive results after just one month. No drowsiness, no want to take a nap during the middle of the day. It actually helped a lot. Well, this is very preliminary, but we also found out is that you lost a little bit of fat mass and put on good fat-free mass during the time you extended your sleep. The study's results are preliminary, but it appears the damage done to metabolism by sleep deprivation can be reversed. After short period of sleep deprivation, if you were to recover your sleep for two days, two consecutive nights, uh, you can recover your uh, diabetes risk to baseline. Just catching up on sleep is a simple treatment, but Dr. Tasali dreams of a day when doctors will actually prescribe sleep guidelines for different illnesses. And she says most people don't need a full lifestyle intervention to reap the benefits. There's an obvious improvement that almost everyone can make. So turn off your iPhone, iPad, or all the uh, other devices, a TV, after a certain period of time. That works the best. 
It's a simple prescription, but there are other options. And an entire industry is banking on turning sleep into big business. Next, a booming business Hi, you? lulling you to sleep. The ability to diagnose sleep disorders has caused a huge proliferation of sleep medicine, sleep laboratories around the world. It's a modern day epidemic. The number of adults who sleep less than six hours has grown quite significantly from 20% to, over, to around 30% in the last few decades. A burgeoning industry is promising relief from all that sleeplessness. Time to wake up to sleep better. The Paziz sleep module will ease you into a deep, calm sleep. Unison sleep taps are clinically proven effective. Sleep medicine over the last 30 years is probably one of the most rapidly growing areas of medicine, definitely. Companies selling pills, gadgets and apps, cashing in on your fatigue. Industry grows when there's an opportunity, a per perceived need, and people who will buy the products. And the business of sleep is certainly growing, catapulting into the tens of billions of dollars. Monitoring your sleep quality has never been this easy. For those of us who simply can't fall asleep, there's a pill for that. The pharmaceutical industry has a lot at stake. I mean, they've been making sleeping pills or drugs for anxiety and sleep for 30 or 40 years. Do you often stay awake at night? <laughs> Try some Somidex, the new aid to sleep. The industry has ballooned since those days. 20 million sleep aid prescriptions were handed out in Canada last year. Drug companies are investing significant research dollars to develop new classes of drugs. And the sale of over-the-counter sleeping pills in Canada is growing two to three times faster than other products on the shelf. If you removed all the sleeping pills from the market tomorrow, you would have a public health emergency on your hands because people who are dependent on these drugs need them. We're cutting back on sleep. We're medicating to fall asleep. But perhaps the biggest piece fueling this industry is that more Canadians than ever are being diagnosed with sleep disorders. We're now developing sleep disorders we never ever thought of in a sleep texting, where kids are doing this in a partially awake state. They're texting each other. I mean, there's so many sleep disorders, hard to name just the top three. More than 90 sleep disorders have been identified to date. And according to at least one report, up to 40% of Canadians are affected. The ability to diagnose sleep disorders, the ability to treat them, has caused a huge proliferation of sleep medicine, sleep laboratories around the world. The sleep lab testing business is expected to be worth nearly $9 billion in the US in five years. To find out what a sleep lab is all about, we sent one of our producers, Claude Adams, to Hamilton Sleep Disorders Clinic to take the test. Hi. Your last name? I'm Claude, Claude Adams. Claude has been complaining of poor sleep for years. Wakes up repeatedly in the middle of the night, snores and feels groggy the next day. This will be your room for tonight. All right. All righty, so what I'll give you is a few things. So there's a pair of scrubs that we're gonna ask you just to change into. What Claude is about to undertake is a polysomnogram, which the industry considers the gold standard of sleep testing. So I should just follow you? Yes, please. So what I'll be doing is I'll be measuring up parts of your head and I'll be marking it with a little red marker pencil. 28 electrodes are precisely placed on different parts of his body. They'll monitor heart rate, body motion, eye movement, breathing, and oxygen levels. So anything I say when I'm sleeping is off the record? Yes. <laughs> there you go, sir, so we are done. Great. The hope for Claude is that the information this test provides could change a pattern he's developed over 50 years. My wife goes to bed with earplugs every night and she tolerates me for the first three or four hours and then I wake up and I begin going to my heavy snoring. So I would, I would leave at uh, three or four in the morning and uh, 
go to my office and sleep on the futon. It was turning into a sleep divorce. And it was, uh, you know, we joke about it, but it can get quite serious after a while. Perfect. Now blink your eyes. Continuously for five to ten seconds, like blink, 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 and keep on doing it. At 11, the test begins. If everything goes right, you'll see me in the morning. If not, just speak up and I'll be here, right? Okay. Good night. Good night. Until 545, a technician will watch and listen to Claude's every move. And this is what they find. Snoring, as expected, but listen to what punctuates it. Nothing. This is the sound of Claude as he stops breathing. A telltale sign of sleep apnea. When Claude wakes, he has no idea what happened. Please have a seat over there. Dr. Raymond Gottschalk is about to tell him. Now, what is quite evident here, and this is remarkably so, is that you have severe sleep apnea. You stop breathing 43 times per hour. Really? Slow or stop breathing, yes. The good thing about it, if there is a good thing about this, is it is predominantly what we call supine related or positional. On your back, you stop breathing 67 times per hour. Okay? <laughs> okay. And on your side, on your right side, which was your other predominant time during sleep, about seven times an hour. So there is a clear stratification of positional sleep apnea. They stop for how long? Uh, these stoppages are probably about 20 seconds. We only call an apnea once you've stopped breathing for 10 seconds. I see. Okay. Uh, the most commonly used treatment is, is nasal CPAP, uh, which, uh, as we've got this uh, mannequin over here, it's, it's this space age apparatus. And all it does is this is just providing a fit of a mask where air is blown through it to balloon up in the airway. To spend a night in bed with that. On it's face. much better than the alternative. <laughs> Claude's case is typical of this clinic. About half the patients who come in are diagnosed with sleep apnea. Yeah, I'm surprised. I'm surprised at the, at the level of the disorder. Well, you know, so, so moderate to serious apnea. Hey, I'm going to bite the bullet and I'm going to do the, do the mask, do the CPAP, uh, as, as unpleasant as it looks at first. In the, in the long run, it's, it's better than the snoring and it's, it's better than the feeling of restlessness when I wake up. And it's better than the medical risks that can go along with sleep apnea. We know that sleep apnea increases your risk of developing high blood pressure, heart attacks, strokes and heart failure by three to four fold compared to somebody who doesn't have it. When we look at the cost of people who are untreated with sleep apnea, they are huge compared to once they are treated. In Ontario, the cost of a CPAP mask is mostly covered. About 10 years ago, there was a study done to show that Ontario was spending around $75 million a year just on sleep studies, let alone CPAP devices. But all of that sleep testing and sleep treatment comes at a cost to taxpayers in the province. Not surprising, given there are more than 100 sleep labs in Ontario. We have one of the highest rates of sleep studies in the world. But that's just in Ontario. At clinics in other parts of Canada, patients can wait up to a year for a test and pay upwards of $2,000 for a CPAP mask. It's why the companies behind the masks are posting huge profits. 80% of the people in Ontario and probably more than that in the rest of Canada, will have sleep apnea but have been undiagnosed. So that means there's a tremendous potential to expand even further. But if there's one place that's truly capitalizing on the sleep industry, it's here, Sao Paulo, Brazil, at the Institute of Sleep, otherwise known as the Tower of Sleep. 16 floors, 81 beds. Almost all of the patients pay out of pocket. And they can still wait months to get in. They call my institute of sleeping hotel or the Taj Mahal of the sleeping. Huh? And I was very proud with that. Dr. Sergio Tufik is the founder. I think he's the biggest of the world. The institute feels more like a hotel than a sleep lab. This floor has 17 rooms. This is a big room that we can come with the company. We can bring your husband, your wife, 
your father, your mother, and we can both sleep in together. No? But hotels don't have this. 300 people work here, running sleep tests, training doctors on sleep treatment, and conducting sleep research. Dr. Tufik opened his Tower of Sleep in 2002 and says not long after, sleep science and the industry exploded. 2007 was the year for us, no? because we discovered that one third of population has apnea. The, the world for us changing science at that time. If I produce anything, no? if 10% of one third of the population agree with that, what that my product, they will sell millions and millions. Uh, if I have an industry, uh, I invest in this segment because uh, no, no chance to make a mistake. With so many struggling to get to sleep and growing evidence of the health costs of scaling back on sleep, research and the business of sleep will continue to grow as evidence continues to build that getting a good night's rest is worth the price. Next, nodding off behind the controls of a train. He's performing as if he's legally drunk. This person, if he were driving a car, would be 7.2 times as likely to have a fatal collision on the highway. 